What is up? It is Joey Sven. And everything's fine. Wi Fi is all right. Your stereo is okay. I'm just being a dummy. But I'm hoping that everybody's doing okay out there amidst all the craziness. It's hard to be totally okay, but hopefully there is some dandiness in your heart a little bit. And maybe listening to this podcast can just add a little bit to that. I wanted to share right up front a tweet that I just saw this morning that Jason Petty most of you know him as Propaganda. Do you know his name was Jason Petty? His name, you know, Propaganda at Prop Hip Hop, if you want to follow him. Posted something from Richard Rohr, and I'm like, how can people be so smart and eloquent and insightful? And I just had to share this one, my friends. So, Richard Rohr on liberals. Liberals seem unable to call their own consumer lifestyles into question. And, oh yeah, by the way, we're going to get to conservatives, so chill. It's good. They cannot see their complicity in the system and thus can't radically critique it. In my experience, liberalism creates suspicious people more than loving people. They begin by asking, who has the power here? Instead of, how can I serve here? Liberals seem incapable of being part of a tainted anything. Food, institutions, histories, explanations, groups, churches, and most especially authority structures of any kind. American liberalism, in my opinion, has no practical goal beyond maintaining personal and social freedom. Quote, I choose, therefore I am, end quote, might be its operational belief system. And by the way, If you've never heard Richard Rohr talk, you know these words are delivered in the most gentle, kind, loving, gracious, and not in any sort of demeaning way, teddy bear Richard Rohr sort of way. I'm the one that sounds stupid here. All right. Mic drop on the liberals. Next up, mic drop on the conservatives. If liberals refuse to be part of of the dirt of history, conservatives refuse to even see the daggum dirt. I inserted daggum. At least in their own group. Conservatism's basic sin is lack of courage, but also lack of exposure or education. It usually does not know about the dark side, the other side, the view from the bottom, or even from the top. It confuses loyalty to systems with loyalty to God. Conservatives in general are so enamored with presidents and popes and precedents that there is never any room for prophecy or honest self-criticism. Ba-boom! Pretty good stuff there. Really deeply profound stuff. Can we all just look at ourselves, be critical, maybe more critical to ourselves, than others. I'm going to stop right here. I'm going to let Richard Rohr own this. <laughs> I can't add anything to that. So I will try to add to this episode by introducing you to Lance Haverkamp. I know many of you are tuning into this episode because of the title. Some of you, so you can roll your eyes and poke holes through the whole daggum thing, while others of you are wanting to embrace something like this and interested in hearing some good, educated support for it. I'd encourage everyone, if you're not on a side, don't worry about it. You don't need to pick a side. You don't need to have completely in your mind made up what you feel about the possibility of Christian universalism, but Maybe just take the next 45 minutes pondering the possibility. Just pondering the possibility. Now, I'm not sure. It's been a while since I've had this talk with um, Minister Lance. And so I don't know if he's the one that said this or if someone said this to me later. But I think he said this in this interview. He said, basically... If we are wrong about Christian universalism, then we can only be blamed for giving God too much credit. 
maybe not his exact words, but you get the point. And I think that is a pretty cool thing to reflect on. But let me go ahead and get this thing going. Guys, this is Lance Haverkamp, who serves at Christian Universalist Association. Their website can be found in the show notes. You all have a good day and rest of the week. Enjoy the episode. Appreciate you joining us. We are here with Lance Haverkamp. We were just talking about if, if it was pronounced in, in German, it would be Haverkamp, which I have a little German background, so I'm proud of myself. I, I, Good for you. I think, I think I nailed your last name there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't, but you did, so great. There you go. There you go. I was telling Lance literally that this is a conversation that I have been looking forward to more than probably any other conversation I've done on this podcast. We have a lot of listeners from all different spiritual journeys. I would say some would still hold fast to maybe even some fundamental evangelical types of thinking and maybe get pissed off at some of these episodes, but most people are, are, definitely wanting this conversation. I would say a lot of our listeners are kind of in a headspace where they're just rethinking things. And a, a friend of mine, and I'll, I'll go ahead and say that I may misquote him here and he can get me later, but Preston Sprinkle, we were, we were talking about Christian universalism and he said something to the effect of, if it's true, it, again, may not be perfectly accurate with what he said, but something to the effect of it fixes everything. And he, you know, he's a theologian. He's helped write some books for Francis Chan. And that just makes so much sense. And I think a lot of us, a lot of people that listen to this podcast, a lot of people that are in similar places as, as me on our spiritual journey, there's just so many questions. And if this is true, then it fixes everything. It seems like it, but everything that we've ever been taught just says no way in hell is this true. So I, I grew up right. I grew up in very fundamentalist Pentecostal churches. I definitely relish some of that tight knit community that I had, but I was very much so warped spiritually by just always fearing hell. I mean, hell consumed my mind all through high school. I'm thinking, am I going to go to hell even though I believe, but maybe I'm not believing enough? If all these friends that I'm eating lunch with are going to hell, I probably should witness to them, but I'm scared as hell to talk about hell because, and, and, oh my gosh, like I, I actually have recently been mourning in a good way, in an accepting way, my high school years that was just completely in like rampaged by my religiosity. And so, and probably three or four years ago, there is a guy named Chris Date. He has a podcast called Rethinking Hell. And it was for it was the first time I was ever introduced to annihilationism. And this guy is he is in infallibility, predestination, Calvinist. I mean, just hardcore, a lot of stuff that I'm not, but I was like, oh my gosh. So there's like a legit approach to the Bible that God just extinguishes people that don't follow him. That's a lot better than people burning forever or in this super dark, miserable place forever. And so I, I kind of, and, and he is an unbelievable debater, and so listening to his arguments, definitely I, t- I took to them, and it just feels like maybe that was a stepping stone. So where I'm at now, and I'll pass the baton here to you in a second, I started to realize, I was like, you know, I approach the Bible how I was taught to approach the Bible. I have presuppositions that people that don't seek God, don't accept Jesus, they go to hell. So when I read these eternal damnation, weeping and gnashing of teeth verses that in the past that immediately signaled, oh yeah, that's what I've been taught. Okay, that makes sense. But then when I read redeemer of all things or not only our sins, but also the sins of the whole world, I figure out a different way of processing that or I just chalk it up to eh, some scriptures you just don't understand. It obviously can't mean that. And so I just started recognizing I don't I don't know if there's as many universalism scriptures 
as the the stuff that sounds like eternal conscious torment but it sure does line up more with god's character than anything but but just the fact that to believe in the traditional type of hell that i've believed in the vast majority of my life i do have to throw away some scriptures i do <laughs> and 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 that's um, a battle for a lot of people right Right. So, you know, I, I want to hear a lot of I want to hear I want people to hear about your organization and, and all of that because I'm, I'm fascinated. But let's just jump. Let's just jump right into this. So I am reading a lot of the material on the website and the brochure that you, that you've sent. It sounds like you guys believe that this this is what Peter believed. This is what Paul believed. This is what the church believed early on. Is, is that is that the case? It, it is, and actually it predates Christ. Uh, the, the Jewish community pre-exile, so we're looking at you know, 600 to 800 BC, uh, the, the Jewish community believed that their Messiah would come and restore Israel to their home. They thought that right. Israel would, would be you know, the important place worldwide, that God would have all the nations believe and understand and accept their Messiah as the ruler of heaven and earth at that point, and that that all would be alive and, and restored in relationship with God. Now, you know, that belief of those Jews carried forth into the New Testament church. So, you know, for the first gosh, 500 years or so, this was the overwhelming understanding of the early church, that God would restore all things through Christ to him. And so so this this is not something you are, like obviously the organization you're a part of, this isn't a hunch. You guys are, are hardcore convicted that this, this is the reality. Absolutely, and it's not new within denominational strains either. Uh, most of us have heard of the Unitarian Universalists, and most of us would know that that was a merger uh, many years ago between the Universalist Church, who was Christian at the time, and the Unitarian Church, who were Christian at the time. But after the merger, they largely disbanded their belief in Christianity, so now they're more of a secular, humanitarian, religious-esque kind of organization right. with a small contingency that's still Christian. Right, right. <clears throat> so I understand that you may answer this question by saying, but it is. <laughs> <clears throat> My question is, why weren't things made a little more clear, clearer scripturally? Like I think about just the sort of, like if, if this is true and I lean into it and I so, so hope that it's true, you can literally label the teachings of, of hell and damnation as toxic just absolutely toxic it has warped the the message it is it is warped the the church's approach i mean it, it warped me as a high schooler and it just seems like there was so much talk from even jesus about you've got sheep you got goats follow me or don't follow me if you don't forgive others i won't forgive you i mean just all these better do this or you're going to be screwed sort of talk and then you do have paul talking about eternal damnation and and those sorts of things so it just seems like if you read the scriptures at face value i mean i'll go ahead and concede to the fact that it seems to point to more of a narrative of people not going to heaven, lots of them. Yeah, yeah, it's it's something that we're accustomed to because you know my upbringing was not terribly different than yours. I was raised American Baptist, which is not fundamentalist per se, but you know certainly in the twentieth century it was a conservative evangelical denomination. So, and a lot of us come from that background. Uh, so we we read scriptures like that and we understand them in the context that we grew up understanding them. You and I, you know, especially you know those of us who studied theology, you know, hear things in the background and hear things at seminary that talk about different understandings, different reads on it. The killer for most Christians is certainly in North America is that they're reading a translation that was translated by somebody who had already been raised the same way we were in in terms of understanding hell, in terms of uh, you know the the this construct that was added to scripture 
during its translation into Latin and then into English and carried forth through the fundamental North American church of the 19th and 20th century. So we're not really reading the Bible wrong. It's, it, was, it was translated wrong. There were some translation issues, and some, no doubt. And, and there are some verses in Scripture that talk about God wanting us to wrestle through ideas. You know, it's a matter of, of God to conceal a thing and a king to discover a thing. Um, in the Old Testament, we see, te- we see God giving a message of error to someone, so they had to wrestle with understanding. Uh, that's a reality in Scripture. It's not something we talk about much because that opens a can of worms that our, our pastors and our, and our seminary professors don't want to deal with, but it's, it's there. Yeah. So, so if someone asked, dude, how, how in the world, where, where are you getting this from that the early church and Jesus and his followers and Paul and Pete, like, where are you getting this from that they were universalists? Like, what, what would you point them to? You get it from reading the earlier translate the earlier languages of Scripture. You get it in the early teachings. Um, you can go through history and talk about, you know, people like Clement of Alexandria. You can talk about Origen and read their writings, uh, those that survive, uh, and understand that they saw this very differently than what you and I hear in a modern pulpit today. Yeah. So... If someone, uh, all right, so I, I, you know, just one verse, Thessalonians one nine, they will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. How was that? Tra- like, what what should that sound more like? And I'm, I, you know, I don't know if you you can pick apart any verse I, I throw at you, but is are we are we reading that? Like, is, is that translated off? Yes. You're, you're not reading off translations there as, as much as it is off understandings. Um, when you look at terms in Scripture that were translated eternal torment, eternal damnation, uh, what have you, there's some issues there in terms of torment versus torture uh, versus correction. Uh, it was all the, pretty much the same word back in the Greek, you have um, Aeonios and you have Colossus, uh, and, and those two words are thrown together in translations as meaning everlasting torment, but a better translation is probably a correction for the age or a correction for the ages. Um, we can get into Greek all day long, but, but you know we'll put everybody to sleep if we stay here too long. There are definitely scholars who have written about those translations and can read up on your, you know, or your subscribers can read up on it if they want to. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll put some of the, the main ones in, in our show notes too. I'll, I'll ask you maybe after the show what to, what to post. So you, you would say that the, the main evidence that this was the primary way of thinking the first 500 years of the church would be reading the teachings of people in the first 500? Yeah, it would be those saints during that time frame that, that the churches have recognized, whether it's you know Western Church or Catholicism or the Eastern Orthodox Church, they each have saints during those time frames that have written about these subjects, and you really get a good understanding that pretty early on, basically forever beyond earlier than that point, they had thought that everyone would be saved somehow. Now, they knew there was correction. They knew there was chastisement for bad behavior. They understood the context of, of, of sin having come into the, to, to, to humanity. Uh, different read on that between the Orthodox and the Catholic, yeah. obviously. But they understood that, and they looked at it and, and said, okay, so there's correction. If yeah. I rob if I rob a liquor store tomorrow, there's correction, right? Yeah. So how how do we make sense it, taking everything into consideration, translations and all of that? How do we make sense of Jesus's clear distinction between two types of people? And it seems that it doesn't even seem speculative. It seems like there's going to be a major consequence for those that don't love their neighbors. And, and that gets into what this podcast was discussing, what was it, second week of the March 
you know, the discussion got on to universalism and, and how we read this and, and whether or not annihilationism is, is a legitimate read. Um, you get into those kind of questions. Uh, there's, you have to look at it in terms of, yes, you can argue different things from Scripture. Uh, and you guys discussed that a bit last month. You, you can read this stuff and, and come up with slightly different interpretations. You can certainly find a bunch of Scriptures that lead towards Calvinism. You can certainly lo- find a bunch of Scriptures that lead you towards thinking Arminianism. Um, you also have people who discuss annihilationism. And, and for example, the Adventists you know, teach, teach annihilationism just like Fudge taught it. Uh, so you've got these different views. Now, we have a, a, a great book uh, from, from Thomas Talbot uh, available. Uh, you can get it at your local bookstore. You can get it anywhere. He discusses this problem in, the, in, in his best-known book. It talks about the fact that uh, you, you can find each of these verses in Scripture, but not to the exclusion of the other points of view, which means it's time to engage your brain and figure out how you discern between those verses that seem to disagree on who's saved, who's not, and how. The book I'm talking about is The Inescapable Love of God. Again, Thomas Talbot's the author. Uh, Great read about how to balance your view based on the fact that all three groups, four in fact, can, can find verses that support their beliefs, and, and, you know, what do we do with that? Yeah. So why, so universalism comes out on top because, <clears throat> because of maybe Jesus's teachings on, on love and love your enemy. And I mean, just the fact that he said, father, for, forgive them. And, you know, one thing as, as far as scripture is concerned, this all, I've always been, very confused about this one is for people that point to the passage where they say, Lord, Lord, didn't I do this in your name and that in your name? And he, and he says, depart from me. I never knew you because when you didn't do it to the least of these, you didn't do it unto me for people that point to that Mm -hmm. for eternal punishment. If you take it that way, it debunks the concept of salvation. Like it basic, you're basically saying Jesus is saying that you didn't do enough to earn salvation. So I'm like, how can you even touch that one? <laughs> like that's got to mean yeah. something a little different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I remember talking to somebody recently about John three sixteen, and you know we made the usual jokes about holding up the sign at the football game, you know. But the very next part of that that sentence. You know, at John three seventeen that nobody looks at uh, is God sent His Son into the world not to do, to judge the world, but to save the world through Him. You know, it's yeah. the very next verse. Yeah, it's it's you know, and and they didn't even have punctuation in the Greek like we do in today's translations. So, you know, it is the continuation of the very same thought. Yeah. So you, I am assuming, would say. Contrary to to what you know, I, I feel, <coughs> and it probably has a lot to do with my upbringing. I feel like uh, a very surfacey reading of the New Testament. You're probably going to come out of that thing as thinking, okay, yeah, there's a place that people go to that never accepted God. You would probably say, as a whole, it seems to point more towards universalism. I would say it seems to point more towards universalism when you take the whole in context and read it within an understanding of, of the Christ that we see in the New Testament, the God that we see in the Old Testament, you know, um, Isaac's sacrifice. I mean, all this stuff goes to show that God wants to save all, but there's going to be people who disagree for all of this lifetime. And that's one of the reads of, of universalism. You can read it as a love, as a, as a love belief and, and you know, what we used to call sloppy agape for fun. Uh, you, know, you can read it as love scriptures. You can read it as historical, uh, you know, patristic universalism. Uh, in fact, there's a book by, a book by that name uh, by David Burnfield that's quite good. It talks about the fact that the early church 
thought this way and, and what their exact interpretations were. That's another good read your, your, your subscribers should know about. Yeah. Um, but there's, there's different views. I mean, there's the, in addition to the, you know, the sloppy agape, so to speak, there's the, the, we've got the patristic, patristic view. We've got more modern interpretations where, yeah, okay, um, maybe some of scripture was written a little biased by old men and, and translated by old men. And, you know, you get that kind of uh, progressive theology read. But all of those views fit within the umbrella of yeah, this is Christian universalism as we understand it today. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, uh, for me, the the two biggest passages, very short little things to point at in the New Testament is is a, j- just the very fact that we're asked to love our enemies. Like, imagine if I taught my kids to love their enemies, but I went out and murdered everybody who crossed me. Like it just, it just, it just doesn't make any sense. Well, yeah. And I mean, then, my parents told me to love, you know, the love my enemies stuff, but, but they also told me, you know, if somebody takes a swing at you, punch him back. Right. 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 And, and then just, I, we, we read this so many times and we just have like this f- almost frivolous oh that's kind of like it, it comes across as oh that's so cute that he said that when jesus says father forgive them because they don't know what they're doing we're like man jesus is so cool and loving but if we take that approach it, it, he just said something nice it, it, what's the what's even the point of that like i think we really need to slow down with that one and be like okay wait a second if this is the Messiah, the savior of the universe and his heart is to forgive people because they don't know any better. Right. But then we want to say that God is completely different from that. It's just, it starts not to line up. But when we look at the old Testament, that God seems to be someone who's totally down with sending a lot of people to hell. So how do you read Old yeah. Testament stories? I mean, the flood, the the Canaanites and, and all of that. Different people e- have Even different... Ananias and Sapphira sure. in the New Testament. Yeah, different people have different reads on that. Uh, I, I can give you my read. I can give you yeah, a couple of other, other reads that people have had for, for those over the years. Um, some read that those are, you know, that was groups that were getting in the way of God spreading the true message and that he knew that they would all be saved in the end, if not in this lifetime and the next. God and these could, are the people writing about God's wrath? They, 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 well, the, they just, well, you know, the, when God said, you know, go into the, uh, take the country, kill all the, the men, women, and children, even kill the cattle, you know, you've got this read that, that, wow, who's this harsh God? And, well, of course, a God that said, go in and kill every man, every woman, every child, and all the cattle would have no problem sending somebody to hell. But the read for some people is, uh, and myself included on this, is that, you know, these people were, were getting, they were an obstacle to getting the message across. They were, they were blocking God's people. They were blocking the progress of, of God's story. God was going to save them in the end, if not in this lifetime, in the next, so that they, you know, they may, God may be looking at them saying, these people are never going to learn this in this lifetime. They're going to be an obstacle forever. Get rid of them, get the obstacle out of the way so the true story can continue, and I will save them in the next life. That's the wow. read I have for, for that, those kind of, of interpretations. Um, again, different people will have different reads on this, but it's certainly understandable within the context of a loving God and a loving Christ. Yeah. Do you ever take in consideration that maybe the Israelites thought that God told them to do that and he really didn't? That's another read. That's certainly a, a, a long discussed, long argued read. Um, you know, certainly what we now call in North America, progressive Christians, progressive yeah. Christianity will have that read that look, you know, this was just what they thought they were supposed to do. The same people will argue that the, the Bible is not God's record of reaching out to us as humans, but rather our record of trying to reach up to an unseeable, untouchable God. 
that's yeah. convenient if you're trying to whitewash scripture out of the out of the the, the narrative. Um, but that's an that's a read you don't have to take. It's 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 a direction you don't have to go and still have a very defensible view of Christian universalism. Yeah. Yeah. So for for context for me and our listeners, how would you describe your interaction with it, with the Bible? Would you say it's very authoritative, completely authoritative, um, just just a record of stuff that God uses once in a while? Like how do you see the Bible? Christian universalists throughout history will have different reads on that. Again, I'm getting tired of saying that, so I apologize to everybody no, for fine. saying That's there's good. different yeah. reads. But I want you to understand that this is not one size fits all. It's it's complicated. So you know we have um, we have uh, people looking at that where a a a a believer will will read that. How do I want to word this? Give me, give me, give me a better, give me a re, reword on that question because I had a thought that I've lost and I want to go back. Yeah, to yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Um, so basically, how do you, how would you describe your interaction with the Bible? There's, there's Christians that basically say, you know what, we have to lean more on experience. We mm-hmm. have to lean more on the Holy Spirit to make sense of all this. And some of those very people would say. But it is spirit inspired. We just don't know what the hell to do with it. So we really need God's help. But then there's definitely some very sincere, genuinely seeking God Christians who just don't see it as super authoritative, but maybe something that God does inhabit and, and does use. I mean, I think a lot of people would probably assume that Lance doesn't see the Bible as super authoritatively or else he couldn't have this belief. Yeah, yeah. In terms of me personally, they'd be barking up the wrong tree. Uh, my, my upbringing is conservative, and my read on universalism is, is very much the same way. Uh, what do we do with, with people that, that want to argue those things? As, a, as an association, as Christian Universalist Association, you know, we're the big umbrella group. We don't have a strong position on whether you're reading scripture as as fairly literalistic um, or 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 figurative there are certainly places where each come into play you can't shut your brain off and and read it as wooden literalism because that doesn't make sense Um, some denominations conservative denominations will will argue that the scripture should be interpreted literally until they get backed into a philosophical corner and then they will grudgingly say okay maybe that verse is figurative but in reality the hebrew the greek um, the aramaic all had the same complex figures of speech and beliefs that that we do in terms of you know raining cats and dogs in terms of you know all these expressions who meant something which meant something to them uh, and we see that in the forever verses as well. Uh, certainly, when we read something in the Old Testament, it sounds like that they're going to you know, this torture is going to go on forever. We read the same words talking about Jonah in the belly of the fish. He was he was there forever. Well, no, he wasn't. It may have seemed like forever to Jonah. In reality, he was only there for three days. We I didn't even this, realize it says that. So it, in Scripture, it, it says does. he was there forever. It's the, wow. it's the same Hebrew uh, word that we translate to to forever in in Scripture. Uh, we have the same problem with uh, the the Aaronic priesthood. Uh, Aaron's Aaron's priests were said to be in the temple forever. Well, that priestly system did not go on forever. In fact, the whole temple was later destroyed in 70 AD. So, you know, the, the terms that, that they used in those ancient cultures that we translate today into um, uh, the Latin ad infinitum, in other words, forever, really didn't mean that in those cultures at that time. They did not have this ad infinitum, infinity goes on forever and ever and ever and ever, amen, they were using the term in terms of how things felt. 
yeah. not in terms of literal chronological infinity. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, that's where I start thinking, well, dadgummit, God, why didn't you just make it to where we could understand more? And then there's a part of me that's like, you know, humans are so messed up as far as what we reject and, and what we don't care about. And I guess if you're God, like you, you said something to the effect of, of this earlier on in the long run, you're like, oh, I'm going to save all my children. Like at, at the end, I get the, the last say. And I would imagine when he observes 80 years for a person's life on this earth, it's it could probably be similar for how I evaluate five minutes. You know, I mean, it just it fixes everything. Exactly. <laughs> like I said from the beginning, it you're, fixes you're, everything. You're talking you're not talking about a, a God that is subject to the laws of physics, you're talking about the God who invented the laws of physics. To try to limit him to our time frame in terms of you know single passage through one-way direction through time, he's God. You know, yeah. he doesn't have these kind of limitations. He invented time. He invented right. physics. He's not subject to it. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't expect you to, to be able to speak on behalf of Eastern Orthodoxy, but my brother is really engaged in those teachings and, and he, he had the same upbringing as me and he's really taken to this approach. It, I, if I heard correctly, they claim the same thing that you referenced as far as like the first 500 years sure. Christians believed in universalism. They're saying, we've stayed true to scriptures up until 2020 since the very beginning we've we've had the right interpretation of scripture but i'm pretty sure they they definitely don't believe in universalism they don't believe in like a a, a literal fiery pit either but i think something to the the d degree of people just being separated from god forever yeah um i yeah. guess they can I I would love to be more of an Orthodox scholar than I am. Yeah. Yeah. They have a term called theosis that in the Greek is, is an understanding that when God put us on, on earth to learn to grow, to understand things, and that the, the longer we live in this lifetime or the next, the more godlike we become. That's very much a, a orthodox view of, of what goes on in terms of the future, uh, past end of the world, heaven. We continue to grow, continue to learn more, continue to become more like God. Um, I don't know that it would be in the same sense that the Mormons teach that we all become gods of our own little worlds, you know, in future lifetimes. But, but that's that understanding of theosis does carry through to the historic understandings of, of Christian universalism, that theosis read that read that we are designed to grow, learn, and become more like God is an accepted part of that big umbrella of Christian universalism. And, yeah. and yes, the, the Orthodox still teach it to this point. Uh, David Bentley Hart is a Greek uh, Orthodox scholar, uh, theologian, uh, who writes on this stuff. And he has a book, relatively new, um, trying to think of the name of it, uh, That All Shall Be Saved. Again, that's David Bentley Hart. And that's, again, available at your local bookstore. Awesome. All right. Well, let's let's take the last 20, 25 minutes. And I've got a bunch of questions that just basically assumes universalism is true. And so mm -hmm. let's, uh, you know, I'll put my mind there. I challenge the listeners to do the same. So if universalism is true, did Jesus have to suffer in order for us to get this? Like, is there some sort of penal substitutionary atonement that needed to happen for, for us to be able to inherit eternal life? Could God have designed a system where we all were perfect, did everything right, never sinned, followed every teaching God had, Probably. I mean, he's God. If he wanted to design a system that way, he probably could have. What does that not 
cause to happen, it means we never learn anything. It means we never grow. It means we never realize that the idea of dying for dying to self for the, for the sake of others. Um, I think God could have set up a system where there was no sin, there was no error. We were just a bunch of perfect puppets, but I don't think there's anything for us to learn, to grow, to mature to if he had designed the system that way. Yeah. So was was there, when G- Jesus' death was necessary then for us to all have eternal life, is there something going on in the spiritual realm that, given Jesus did not die and rise, we would not like God couldn't have just said, all right, the doors are open. Everybody's coming without yeah. Jesus paying a price. I, Was there a price de- to be paid? I guess it depends on your view of how necessary those were to God. Were, were, was there, is God somehow limited that, that he couldn't accept us without that sacrifice well, you know, that's certainly the teachings of the Western Church, um, but it, it, is it really true? I, you know, is, are, are we limiting God to, the, to, to saying, gosh, it, it's unfortunate, God, that you didn't have the power to create us perfectly, or are we saying he had another process in mind? He had something for us to do, something for us to learn, something that we would need to be able to to impart yeah. to somebody else in the next life, then that's my read. Yeah, so somebody would say, well, then God is pretty sadistic to send his son to do that if it wasn't necessary. Why, why would you say, th- I mean, the re- cru- crucified Christ and resurrected Savior is is the centerpiece of our of our faith. Like, what was, what was the purpose of that? Because I'm... I'm I, I'm more of a Christus Victor sort of approach that there was something to be won and death needed to be swallowed up by a, a victory that only God could obtain for us. But. Yeah, yeah, and I and I got to agree because giving my background it's similar to yours, that's what I heard growing up. Um, I don't know that I necessarily believe these days that, that it was a necessity as much as it was a teaching tool. Yeah. Yeah. Of a new way of life, like surrender, lay down your life, lay down your life for, for your friends, lay, lay down your life for your family. Uh, yeah, I, I think I don't give it, you know, of course, I suppose one one thing we had to keep in mind is that, you know, depending on your view of Trinity or unity, you know, God came to Earth, uh, or you know, God, the God, you know, the the Christ part of God, however that Trinity thing looks, came to Earth. So God was was in essence sending Himself to some degree. Yeah. Um, so you know that the the that the God Himself would come down and become human and die on the cross to save us. Yeah. Wow. You're yeah. talking about, you know, the, 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 the guy who could create physics and time would set himself up for punishment on our behalf. Right. Whether or not you're reading that as Trinitarian or Unitarian is still a huge deal. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah. That I, I like how you said that because my mind, and I think a lot of people's mind goes the route of, okay, so it wasn't necessary. Why in the world did he do that? But then you're like, whoa, 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 wait a second. God did that for his creation. That's unbelievable. It is. And, 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 you know, you, you said it's a, it's a teaching tool and that at face value teaching tool what the that's a big thing for a teaching tool but it's like a monumental teaching tool oh, of yeah. that's how it's god huge. is right absolutely yeah. yeah so one thing that i have been I, and and i say this lovingly it, it typically isn't people that are mean spirited but i i think to, you know i set up these analogies like you know i've got four kids and if two of them decided they weren't going to 
obey me or honor me. And so I just decided, all right, well, your ass is grass. You know, I'm going to either kill you or torture you. And I stopped loving them. Nobody would say, well, that's, that's being a good dad. They deserve that. (laughs) And I hear people say, well, yeah, you're just, you know, because then I would translate that to why in the world would we think God is that way? And that's when people would say, yeah, but you're attributing your humanness on God and your way of reasoning to God. But I sometimes want to respond as, but didn't God give me that sort of reasoning? Like, it not there some good in leaning into those emotional hunches of things that just don't make sense? Great question. I Ooh, mean, did I stump Lance for the first time today? <laughs> you know, it's... It, you know, we, we don't all agree on how to parent. We don't all agree on on all kinds of things. Um you know, and, and taking kind of a sidestep to the, to the discussion, you know, we've got the situation where people will, will, you know, feel like they've got to tell us what to do. I mean, I've got people all over my Facebook thread telling me what I'm doing wrong or telling me what I should do or, or telling me who I should vote for or telling me what I should believe about the state capital protests over the weekend. All these things that, that, people want us to 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 correct us and i think that that human need for arguing beliefs for for forcing everybody to come around to our point of view because obviously we're right you're wrong i i'm me of course i'm right right you know i i i think there's a bigger more godlike story here yeah yeah all right so I was talking to a guy on this show. I really appreciate this guy dearly. I was going to, yeah, I I love him. I don't really know him that well, but of course I love the dude. Really, really good discussion. He has a Jewish background and he, his, his father. So we're, we're talking one generation removed from the Holocaust. And we were talking about, this very thing like the afterlife and the the hell and all of that. And he really did take the approach, uh, and you know, this is aired, so I'm not saying anything behind the scenes, but he definitely took the approach of, I mean, someone like Hitler, my gosh, he deserves punishment. Like at, at some point when someone has such ill regard and just vulgar contempt and, for human life you Mm -hmm. know at some point that person just needs to be punished like how do you react to something like that the historic view of christian universalism would agree uh that there is punishment in the next life for those who turn away from christ turn away from god in this lifetime that is the historic read Um, some people will disagree with that of course everybody's got their own opinion some people will say well you know what about hitler and, and, you know, I heard some clever person the other day re- respond, what about Gandhi? You know, he loved and was willing to die for his people, but he didn't. He wasn't Christian. He wasn't even Jewish. He had no interest in that. So, you know, what about, you know, it leads to a good conversation. Um, did I, did I, I hear you right that, so you're saying tra- traditional universalism would suppose that they would be punished for a while? Did you say that? Yeah, traditional historic view of Christian universalism, not everybody's view, but the historic long-term majority understanding of Christian universalism is that there will be some type of correction, punishment, re-education, whatever you want to call it, in the next life for those who reject God in this lifetime. That's the long-standing understanding of, of Christian universalism. Gotcha. Gotcha. So not necessarily like a punishment, but something that they didn't get, including Gandhi. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, you, you look at Gandhi as being a great guy and, and, you know, willing to suffer for his people. So you'd think, well, obviously somebody that good should be saved, but then the conservative church will say, but he didn't know God. He didn't know Christ. He didn't accept him and say the sinner's prayer. You know, that kind of response is the expected response. But what do we do with this? I mean, would, would God punish Gandhi the same way he'd punish Hitler? 
Right. right. So, and, and that's a good segue to my next question is, do you believe for someone to become a Christian, there is like a transformation that happens, like the, the accepting Christ, being transformed, Holy Spirit comes in. There is a distinction be- between someone that believes and someone that doesn't here on this earth. Gosh, I've heard a lot of people say that, that, you know, their life was changed when they came to Christ, that, you know, I, you hear us, even hear some things talk about um, the sacraments. I mean, some people will say, you know, I was never a Christian. I got drug off to this Catholic service and, and I got, you know, bread and the wine and man, the, the, the fog was lifted from my eyes and I never thought I would become a Christian. That was the last thing. I, you hear these kind of stories. You've heard them in, you know, face-to-face. I've heard them face-to-face. These stories got to be coming from somewhere. There has to be some kind of internal change that takes place. Um, it, it's less easy for you and I to see who grew up in the church, who grew up believing, but boy, you hear these amazing stories from people who didn't grow up. So I I can't help but think there is some honest-to-goodness, life-changing effect. Right, right. Which which would be the purpose of the church is to introduce people to that abundant life Jesus talks about to receive it now. Like, hey, you, you can have this hope now. Right. You, you can you can be there now. You you know, the church wants to educate people, even, you know, Christian universalist believers. You know, some people will say, you know, what do I need a church for? I'm post Christian. I'm post worship. I, I don't want to go listen to some guy preach about something that I may or may not agree with. Uh, and, and that's where I have to put my CUA hat on and say, you know, we're the Christian Universalist Association. We were, you know, what we do is help people who want to spread the truly good news um, by, in terms of ordination, in terms of chaplaincy. I mean, do you really want your your family, sick family member in, in the hospital to be hearing from, you know, eternal conscious torment person when you're worried that your your parents might die from coronavirus in the hospital? Right. Or do you want to have a chaplain that's arguing on behalf of, you know, you know, it doesn't matter that your parents didn't know God in this lifetime. Right. You know, God still loves your parents and still wants to take them, you know, into the next life and, and to learn and to grow and be welcome home with God. You know, and that's what we do. That right. is, at the end of the day, why we exist uh, to, to help people who want to spread the good news to be able to spread the good news. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I would answer that by saying I, I would want the person that believes correctly to yeah. go to the hospital. So if there's yeah. hell and fire and damnation, then yes, please scare my father. So he will accept, which <laughs> sounds so frivolous and shallow, but well, I mean, what else are we supposed to do? Like he needs to know that reality, but yeah. Yeah. Um, and boy, so many of us were raised that way. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, so this is a whole different conversation, so uh, you can just touch on it, but do you believe in the evil enterprise of Satan and demons, and if so, do they go somewhere bad? <laughs> there there does seem to be some working of demons. Too many people see too much and, and have experiences that, that sound like demonic involvement. Uh, there's, there's just too much of, of that kind of story going on, and they all match up in, in a fair amount of details. So it does seem that there is some demonic presence at work still on earth. Uh, we do read in Second Peter that you know, the demons are sent uh, to, to the closest thing Greek terminology had to hell at the time, which is Tartarus. In Second Peter, we read about that, and, and we can understand that there, there clearly is some kind of punishment there going on. So that's not the same terminology that, that Paul and Jesus and whoever else described it, for humans. It's a different, it, different it terminology It does altogether. seem to be different. The terminology in all the rest of Scripture is Hades. That is the Greek... Uh, term initially for the for the god of the underworld of the world but later for for was understood to be the place where the 
where, where you just go when you died. There wasn't any torture or torment concept in that word Hades. Um, it had had the apostles, had the the early writers, uh, the early believers wanted to discuss eternal torment, the perfectly obvious term for them to be using would be Tartarus because that was the term that the Greek-speaking world understood to mean the realm of punishment. That's not where you see anyone in Scripture ever being sent. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's a word that's at Hades, and it means the same thing as, as, the, Greek, as the Hebrew Sheol. It's just where you go when you're dead. It's, it's the, 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 the under-the-earth, buried gone from this world as we know it, but not anywhere else yet. Yeah. Yeah, man. I, you know, I, I like to imagine, and I think of how surprised so many Christians are going to be when we realize, Oh my gosh, like God saved everyone. And then I think about people that rejected God and even had a hardened heart towards God and now see God, you know, it's, 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 it's interesting for me to think of someone that would need to go through something, some sort of punitive measure, because I just imagine if someone's ever in the presence of God, their heart is just melted immediately. And they're just, you know, every knee will bow and every tongue confess voluntarily, (laughs) like, because they're just like, Oh my goodness. And just, just the, the thought of how surprised, people who didn't give God even a second thought on this earth will come face to face with, with, with Jesus and, and recognize how loved they are. It's just going to be, that's unbelievable. Sure. Atheists like, um, um, uh, Hawkins and whoever, uh, that, that, you know, are going to get there and, and be stunned beyond belief to find out that there is actually a God and that he's still loving them despite all the friction that, that, atheist cause during their lifetime here. Yeah. Yeah. So basically the last question, well, actually two more. One would be, what if, what if you're wrong? Do you ever think about that? Like, oh, dang, you know, I'm not, I'm not omniscient. So what if, what if Lance is wrong? Yeah. If Christian universalists are totally off base, totally wrong, what we're guilty of is giving God too much credit. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 I simple. Right. And I've thought too, I love how you said that. Wow. And I've thought that the message of, Hey, you better repent or you're going to go to hell turns so many people off. If you told someone, Hey, God loves you no matter what, there's a way bigger chance that that's something they're going to be attracted to. Oh, I want to, I want a God that loves me no matter what. And so, right. So even if salvation was like a, you know, a transactional thing that your salvation and whether or not you went to hell depended on, it seems like a universal loving God would be a better story. (laughs) Absolutely. Because I've asked that question. What if I'm wrong? And it's like, I don't think I'm causing too much damage here. (laughs) You can attract more flies with honey than with vinegar, I think is the old expression. (laughs) So do you think that, this will ever be the most prevalent view again view for Christians. Yeah, I, I it's definitely feeling like the, the, the second Protestant Reformation. It, it's it definitely got that feel to it because I, since the invention of the internet and, and, you know, there's a reason the Catholics didn't like the invention of the printing press back when, when, when Gutenberg invented movable type because every Wahoo had a voice and, and the internet impl- amplified that more than anything. So, you know, now that the, the message can get out there and it's much more difficult for, for this kind of viewpoint to be suppressed yeah. in modern internet age, I think it's finally going to have the traction it needs to return to its former glory that it was during the early church. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So Christian Universalist Association was birthed in 07, correct? Yeah. We were born in 07. And oddly enough, we we were born as a discussion group for for theology wonks. Uh, That's really all it was, was an online discussion group. And I was, that was before my time. Uh, I was not in at that point, but, uh, you know, they had this discussion group. They, they wanted to be a repository for all things, you know, historical and, 
and, and academic about Christian universalism. And almost immediately they had people coming to them saying, oh, I'm so glad to have found you. I'm about to be defrocked by my denom because I'm teaching universalism. Can I move my ordination to you? Or, or can, you know, I'd love to be able to teach this in, in chaplaincy, but my denomination won't have anything to do with it. And if I start teaching it and start talking to patients' families about, you know, the fact that their, their loved ones are going to be reunited with God, even though they died in a gang war, right. you know, you've got all of this going on. And, and that's what our early members heard was you've got to help us find some way to legitimize what we're teaching to the secular community. We need to be able to, you know, show the hospital board that, that we can, that we're an accepted belief system, that we're not just some wahoo. Right. Uh, so that's how we got born. That was that was what happened to the, that created us. Is this a denomination, a church? We or, still I mean... don't call ourselves the denomination, uh, but obviously the stuff that we do all looks, smells, and tastes like denominational stuff. It's ordination, it's chaplain endorsement. Uh, we do have a minister training program for people who can't go to a traditional bricks and mortar seminary. Yeah. For whatever reason, uh, we have member congregations in several countries around the world. We have uh, members in probably every continent other than the you know, Antarctica. Yeah. We are beginning to be a pretty established thing. Uh, and if you're at all leaning towards Christian universalism or some version thereof, or you just want to learn more about it, by all means, head over to our website, christianuniversalist.org, and uh, read up. We have book links for everything that you, you and I have talked about book-wise cool. today. The links are up there. There's a 24, 25-page article on the history of Christian universalism dating back to Christ and following through to 20th, 21st century. Uh including timelines and denominations that were involved and, and visuals and pictures of the, the, the saints that we're talking about. So by all means, make use of the resources we have available. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I would say about Christian universalism, Lord, I believe, but help me with my unbelief. And, and I'll also lean on people like you because it just, it does, it does. I can't get away from the fact that it, it makes way more sense. It like, does. As, as the Bible as a whole just w makes way more sense. I it mean, does. there's there's just so many things that we have to, I feel, have zero explanation for. Like, wait a second, is God loving or not? You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that whole Old Testament, New Testament argument that, you know, I see two different gods here. Well, you don't if, and, and right. that's that kind of study that you really have to drag yourself through. You've done it. I've done it. So many of us have been there that it's, it's, it's a discussion you have to have internally and a lot of prayer and a lot of discussion with God. Yep. All right. Well, Lance, good having you. If I don't Great talk to here. you again, I'll see you in heaven along with all the Satanists and KKK Absolutely. and all those, all those knuckleheads. <laughs> <laughs> Conservatism's basic sin is lack of courage, but also, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> but also lack of exposure or education. It usually does not know. <coughs> Dang, <gum it. coughs> this is where. <coughs> That's where most people edit. <clears throat>